So, Garden of Ban Ban is a game that keeps on happening. happening. It's a game where you see things, hear sounds, and play a game. Truly, it is a game of all time. But how did such a game even manage to become so popular to begin with? Is it because of the complex characters, the beautiful voice acting, or even the amazing storytelling? Well, it certainly helped, but no. It's not what kickstarted its popularity to begin with. No, apparently all it takes is a single button on the menu screen to even have people's eyes all on you. Or, you know, just wear your inspirations on your sleeve so hard people might as well sue you for copyright infringement. Because of this, it ended up becoming the easiest internet dunking ground to the point where you got freaking MadPat dunking on it in the video title. And you know it's bad when you got MadPat dunking on it. But besides that, from what I've seen, no one has really gone in-depth into critiquing this game as I'm going to today. I, I mean, I don't blame them. Why critique a game that barely puts in any effort when you know the game devs aren't going to care anyways? The reason why I'm doing this is because if the devs won't use the advice, someone who might want to go into game development can't. With that being said, I am not a game developer. At most, I'm someone who works on mods and that's where most of my game developing experience comes from. So you might want to take what I say in terms of game development with a slight grain of salt. Another thing before we start, please do not freaking harass the Euphoria brothers. I feel like this should be a given, but sadly it's not. If we want to critique and discuss the game, then we discuss it in a constructive and polite manner. Now let's head into the video because I know it's going to be a long one. So, what's a better way to start this video than with the main attraction of the game, the characters. And, uh, well, there's something. They are... designs. No, in all seriousness, they're really not that great. Not because they're bad, though some of them can teeter on that border. No, it's mainly because they feel like the corporate version of kids' character designs. But then, what makes a good character design and do they succeed in that regard? I don't think I should go into the basics of character design as a subject, I'd rather save that for another video. So I'll just go into what makes a good design for kids. There are two guidelines I usually follow when it comes to this kind of character design. Count how many times I say character design. Make the character nice and easy to read. The reason why you want to do that is because the kids will have an easier time reading the design. Typically kids have a harder time reading or rather understanding really complex designs since you know those stupid little brains are still developing and all that jazz but examples of this are characters like pokoyo bluey and tootie these character designs are simple enough to read consisting of simple color palettes and shapes resulting in a recognizable character design but what makes these designs better is add personality to the design because you know kids aren't fucking stupid either they can still understand what a character is about by simply looking at the characteristics of their designs things such as color palette clothes accessories etc etc a good example of this would be dora whose design is simple enough to read while still having personality having a simple enough color palette with the colors being next to each other on the color wheel wearing shorts sneakers and a backpack that shows she's a more adventurous type but this isn't just a kid's show, it's a horror media spoofing off of kids' media. So, is there anything else that can be done? Why certainly. Make the design creepy. And I don't mean scary where it's a quick scare or anything like that. The thing you want for a design, especially for something like this, is to make it creepy. Let the fear linger from the design, since the majority of the horror should come from the game itself or what the character is doing. In fact, the best example of this I could think of is none other than Wally Darling himself. His design is simple, with a palette consisting of primary colors, his half-open eyes, and a loose cardigan, implying he's a bit more laid-back or free-spirited. Plus, there's a nice little detail of him having a dog paw on the bottom of his shoes, showing he's friends with Barnaby. So, if his design works as a kid's character design, then how does it work in a horror setting? Well... His design works? by simply staring at you. Surprisingly, his design does not need to change to make the horror effective. Just him simply giving the signature stare is enough to terrify anyone. Damn, he's really scaring all the antisocial audience here, huh? Simply adding sharp teeth and white eyes isn't gonna send shivers down anyone's spine. Unless you're an artist who made scary OCs when you were 15, but I don't think that's a good thing. 
So, did the majority of these character designs actually meet the guidelines? Well, let's see. For the designs, simple. Yep, no doubt about that one. A lot of the characters fall under this category. Ban Ban, Bambolina, Jumbo Josh, Singer Flynn, etc, etc, etc. You think I might as well drop the entire list of characters with the exception of Bitter Giggle? Because, <laughs> Jesus Christ, what the hell am I looking at? No joke, I'm sorry. I think Bitter Giggle has the worst design I've seen out of this entire series thus far, with Kitty Saurus coming in second. Do these character designs have personality? Yo sis, mind telling me what their personality is like? Mm, I don't know, kind of reminds me of a comedy tragedy mask. Already sweet things. Wait, why? Yo, based off the character design alone, what kind of personality do you think this character has? Hmm... The personality seems like they're goofy and funny, but also scary as hell, like they can kill me. Can you tell me what kind of personality this character has, based off the design alone? Well, they seem to have a very sunshine-go-lucky personality. Oh, sweet. Oh, uh, thank you. So, surprisingly, they do an alright job of showing what kind of personality the characters have, albeit it's very surface-level reading of their personality. They're happy-go-lucky. They're goofy. It's the kind of reading that can apply to a lot of characters. Dora, Elmo, Broby, Cookie Monster, Frank and Len, Dr. Two Brains, and so on and so on. They're all either goofy, happy-go-lucky, or just both. Overall, it seems like they do an alright job at showing characters' personalities, but it's kind of surface level. The only exceptions being Queen Balcelia, Sheriff Toadster, and maybe Singer Flynn, but that's just my opinion. As for being creepy... Uh... I'll be upfront. No. Although, to be fair, these designs aren't meant to be scary outright, like Wally Darling or the freaking Annabelle doll pre-horror movie. Except Singer Flynn. Kind of. With his design towering over the player, his fleshy eye opening in kind of a gross way, it's a design that can creep somebody out when used properly. But what about the alterations to the character's designs? Yeah, the alterations do not help in the slightest. Bambolinas is very reminiscent of Sonic.exe with the streaks on the face and the bloodshot eyes. Not really something that creeps people out unless you're like a five-year-old. Bam Bam's alterations are egregious, with his design carrying very similar traits that younger artists do when creating creepy character designs. Just because the eyes are white, the teeth are sharp, and he's got horns for party hats, that doesn't suddenly mean it's going to be creepy. These characteristics can work, but it's all about knowing when to use those aspects within the design. Just to use an old design I made as an example, here we have a design that takes something normally cute and adorable and makes it creepy. This is a rabbit creature that looks weird and kind of gross. We have the basic traits, such as the sharp teeth, but there are other aspects to this design such as the elongated and human-like body, the bone and lack of flesh on the body, its height, stuff like that. Sure, this design isn't top of the line amazing character design, but it uses similar characteristics but just more sparingly. And I made that when I was 15. But hey, maybe the models will make the designs more scary. Oh my god! Wow. These models, wh where do you even begin? I guess there's no better way to start than the way they look. And Jesus, these models do not help with the character designs. From Queen Bouncilia having her model looking like this, to Kitty Saris' model having this look, they're all just terrible. Just looking at them as someone who doesn't do 3D modeling whatsoever, they're all just kind of misshapen. The models either have textures that look off or they just have really bad anatomy, I, I guess. I mean, for fuck's sake, Sheriff Toaster has a pipe for a pelvis. How does this even happen? Queen Bouncelia looks like an actual clay model somebody made in a kindergarten. Foxy, from the first game, looks better than all the new characters in the fourth chapter, and he was made in a car. How are you beaten by somebody whose model was made in a car? Along with this, the majority of these models have one common problem. The fucking amount of polygons that these models have is insane. Like, I'm starting to worry whether this actually beats the Yandere Simulator toothbrush levels of insane, cause it's that bad. These models have way too many polygons, especially compared to Bendy in his monster form. 
Seriously, Bam Bam has a lot of polygons. Jumbo Josh has a lot of polygons. The fucking remote has so many polygons. It's like looking at an eldritch horror. Just the amount of polygons is incomprehensible to the human mind that... That should not be possible. But hey, I hear you say, the more polygons it has, the better it'll look, right? Wow, hello. Nice to see a fellow Glamrock Freddy stan. Here's the thing. While, yes, the models would look good, or at least it should, so long as you know what you're doing, but you really shouldn't if you're making a game. The reason why you don't want to do that is because when you're making models for a cutscene, you can get away with using higher polygon models by pre-rendering. Because it's not like when you watch a movie on Netflix, the application is rendering the models as you're watching the movie. It's just not. It's just loading an mp3 file and displaying the video because it's showing you the compressed version of the scene. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the beginning cutscene of Sonic Unleashed looks gorgeous in comparison to the in-game cutscenes. But, when you use the same models and try to use them in-game, it just gives your PC a death sentence. Because it's not using a pre-rendered version of the model, it's the actual model in-game. The game is rendering that model, rendering the texture that belongs to the model, reading the code, loading the code, running the game itself, and it does that every frame. Every frame in the game. That's why it's a better idea to use lower poly models within the game. Again, Sonic Unleashed is a good example of this, where his Werehog model looks like this in game. Because it's the developer's way of saying, Hey, take it easy there, alright? But this game just doesn't do that. The majority of the original assets are like this, to the point where the numbers peak so high, I am just afraid of even downloading the first game straight to my laptop. But that raises the question. If the original assets are this bad, are the asset store models any better? Well, just to check and see how bad the problem is, I decided to check out the small portion of the credits from one of the games and check the triangles, because for some reason it doesn't want to tell me what the poly count is. And, well, it runs fine if you kind of just lower the optimization or get a higher computer because, like, that's what it says on the Steam page. You know what might help mitigate these problems? Just lower the quality of the models, have them all the way over there, and replace them with better ones when you get close. And trust me, I'm not pulling this out of my ass. If anything, this is one of the most basic things that is done for games. Furby in the Forgotten Land, Security Breach, Stanley Parable, just to name a few. But they did not make the models, so how would they even lower the models? Especially since the models they made are super high poly for no reason. Oh, well, well. Don't you worry your pretty little head. Unreal Engine, which is the engine they use to make Barton, actually has a function that makes LODs. So I'll leave a link to the steps on how to use it because Lord knows the section is already long enough as it is. Like seriously, look up Unreal Engine LOD, it's not that hard. So what's the solution here? I think mostly lowering the polygons on the models might be a good way to start. Just subdivide the models to have less vertices and hey, whoa, what's this? As for the way they generally look, I would make sure they are shaped nicely and all that. A good way I've seen this done is to have a 2D character reference sheet and model the character around that. Or, you know, ask for help if you need it. Hey, this would be a nice spot for a transition. So, I was gonna make this video way back when the second one was out. Lord, help me if this video comes out after the fifth one does. And originally, I was gonna say, well, all the voice acting isn't really that good. Then the fourth one came out, and suddenly, the bar was raised. Quite an amazing feat for Garden, to be honest. So I'm just gonna go from the worst to the best, which is coincidentally nearly the exact order of their first appearance. Starting off, we've got Ban Ban, and oh man, it's not that good. His performance is how I sound when I have the life stuck down to me. And trust me, it's not that he's just monotone, it's that he delivers the lines very flat. In fact, you could do pretty good performances with the monotone voice. Just look at Red Guy where you can tell he's annoyed, confused, or just having a good time. One line sounds different compared to another line, and what helps is the cadences and inflections within his voice. With Bam Bam, he still has those inflections, but it's delivered very dry. 
I've already shown you Ban Ban's performance and Red Guy's performance where they're supposed to display the same emotion, you can tell which one did it better. And his design really does not help with that. Like, out of all the voices, you give him the voice of the 36-year-old guy who's too familiar with the layout of his work. Okay. At least this voice translates nicer to Singer Flynn, who's given personality of said 36-year-old, but he still suffers the same problems as Ban Ban, albeit to a lesser degree. It's dry delivery, barely putting any effort in, and hey, it's just Ban Ban again. You've had a rough day, I can tell. You diligently wait for the moment you leave this wretched place with your child in hand. I can also tell. Then we move on to Bambolina, and honestly, her voice acting isn't too bad. It's not the best, but it's not the worst either. There are times where it's her delivery that's a little off, like this line should probably be read more like... Okay class, the first lesson of the day is math. Over the course of the semester, you'll learn how to annihilate others, how to safely extract the human brain for eating, and... Oh, wait, I made a mistake. I think that's lesson four of the day. <laughs> instead of the way that is read in-game. Okay, class, so the first lesson of the day is math. Over the course of the semester, you will learn how to annihilate others, how to safely extract the human brain for eating, and... Oh, wait, I made a mistake. I think that's lesson four of the day. <laughs> and there are times where it's simply the writing, to where even if a good VA were to read this, they wouldn't have been able to save it either. Honestly, for her, I would say it's a bit more of a practice thing if she wants to continue to voice act. But then we get to chapter 4, and suddenly the voice acting has massively improved. Gee, I wonder why. Like Sheriff Toadster and Queen Bouncelia, whose voice acting is pretty decent. I think they did a good job considering the freaking game they're in. They're not the best, but to be fair, it's not like they're written into situations where they have to give it their all. So they're both an 8 out of 10. Then, finally, Bitter Giggle. Bitter Giggle actually has by far one of the best performances in game. Just the overacting in his voice is perfect for his character being a fucking crazy little goober who wants to make somebody laugh. And he's written to where he has to give it his best, so 9 out of 10. My only complaint is this fucking animation for the guy whenever he's given this grandiose monologue, because I swear, why is he standing like that? But yes, overall, the voice acting has improved. So I would just say keep going in this direction to where you get voice actors to, you know, voice act. And maybe have more fixed cutscenes in the game whenever a character is talking, because there are dead moments where the character is walking without actually needing to. You're waiting for the next moment to happen to continue to play, so why not just do that? Well... Now, there is so much that really annoys me about the gameplay that I might actually have to break this section up into three parts. But sure, make this harder for me as if it wasn't hard enough. The majority of the game just felt like a glorified walking simulator, which I think it might be. Like, you don't look at this and call it riveting gameplay, it, there's just, it's just walking. So, because I want to prove a point and I really like doing stupid shit, I decided to see how much walking there is within the game. How did I decide to do this? Simple. I decided for one hour of gameplay, I will time whenever the player has to walk. And I did this with Garden and an actual good game, Deltarune, because yes, it's gonna be Deltarune. The reason why I decided to do this was to see how much of the game is quote, walking simulator, and Deltarune is there for comparison. Now, I did this with several rules in mind, and I'll go ahead and list them now. Rule 1. No actual gameplay elements. This includes stuff such as puzzle solving, minigames, reading items, and for Deltarune's case, fighting enemies and dodging bullets. You'll see why I included the dodging bullets rule later. Rule 2. The only exceptions to Rule 1 are running from enemies that don't involve any other gameplay aspects. Basically, you're moving in one direction without having to do anything else. A good example of this is the Opila Bird Chase in Chapter 2. Players standing on moving platforms because even though you're not moving your character, the platform is still moving you from point A to point B. 3. No fixed cutscenes. 
obviously you can't move your character, so you can't really walk anywhere. I feel like that's a given. Rule 4. No backtracking unless it is necessary to progress further in the game. So backtracking to find an optional boss is a no-go, but backtracking to the main hub is a okay I went ahead and timed a Deltrune Chapter 2 playthrough and a Garden Ban Ban 3 playthrough. I'll leave them in the description below in case you want to check these out. I sat through an hour of each respective gameplay. What are the results? Well, for an hour of gameplay through Deltrune, the amount of time you spend walking through the game is about 9 minutes. But, the amount of time you spend walking through a garden is about 21 minutes. Oh, but Deltrune is an RPG. It's not fair to compare it to Garden when that game is a first-person horror game. Well, horror is definitely starting to bit. But, yeah, you're right. I see your point. Which is why I also decided to do this with My Friendly Neighborhood. Yeah, tricked ya. Pull the wool over your eyes. So, what does the time look like for My Friendly Neighborhood? Unfortunately, it also takes about 21 minutes walking through the game. Ha! Ah, see? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. See, the thing about these times that I didn't mention is A, they're very general estimations, there's definitely a chance I got it wrong. B, the time for My Friendly Neighborhood includes instances where the player goes into a room to get a cheat tape, which is not necessary to complete the game. And in Garden's case, it leaves out a small portion of walking for the criminal roundup thing and the general walking when a character talks. So if anything, the times would look more like this. But even then, the small difference in time doesn't matter. Because for Deltrune, the reason why the time is shorter is because it doesn't include this. Now, why is that? It's because you're not walking in just a straight path. In fact, this person right here actually doesn't move straight to the right. They're stuck in this back and forth, and that's because of the bullets right there. See, what's going on is that Toby made it to where the environment directly engages with the player without stopping them in their tracks. This is a really good way to do this, because it gets the player used to the bullet dodging mechanic, it makes the player think about where they're going to move, and it's fun! And it's done in more than one way. This kind of gameplay is used to unlock items in the main world and progress forward on moving platforms. But, if Deltrune does that, then what allows my friendly neighborhood to get a pass? Simply put, instead of directly engaging with the player, it does this indirectly. How so? Well, through the environment. To use an example from the game, let's take this giant set. The area is big and allows the player to walk around and explore. Then, you see this clock. You notice that you can interact with the clock, and when you do, a hand lands on the symbol. But you don't see it do anything within your field of vision, so you just ignore it for now. Then, you make it onto a rooftop on one of the set buildings, and you notice two boxes. These boxes have the same symbol that you saw on the clock in the pizzeria. So you go and you interact with them, and the game tells you that the box needs something to open it. Then you think, oh yeah, there is that clock in the pizzeria! Maybe the clock has something to do with this box. So you head on down to the pizzeria, make the hand land on the symbol that you saw on the box, and when you return, the box is open. This, right here, is a good way to engage with the player, because it makes the player look around and take notes of what they see within the environment. It encourages the player to explore and rewards them for noticing stuff like that. In fact, that's the reason why there's so much walking in my friendly neighborhood because of stuff like that. So, if My Friendly Neighborhood has a good reason for so much walking around, does that apply to Garden of Ban Ban? Does the environment directly engage with the player? Not that I've seen. You're not dodging anything within the environment, you're not holding on to dear life trying to walk to the next area, you're kind of just walking, and that's really it. How about indirectly then? Are you indirectly engaged to find stuff within the environment? If you count the case update reports, the random notes, and the cassette tapes, then sure, I guess? Side note, the things that are showing secret videos within the game are cassette tapes, which they aren't visual, they are audio. If you want an old box that holds magnetic tape to show videos, then what you're looking for is a VHS, not a cassette tape. Cassette tapes play Girls Just Wanna Have Fun by Cindy Lauper on the Sony Walkman, not Timmy's Embarrassing 4th Birthday Party in 1984. Yeah, anyways, back to the point. But, besides that, the game doesn't even encourage you to explore that much. 
I mean, like, for fuck's sake. Deltrun is just as linear as Ban Ban, and it allows for more exploration than this game does. I just... This is frustrating. Just from game design alone. You know, now that we mentioned how the environment can encourage the player to be engaged with the game, I think it's about time we move on to my second point. I would like to talk about how the mechanics affect world building, but before I do, I have to explain what are game mechanics. Basically, it's an action within a game. Think of it like soccer, or football, whatever suits your fancy. Kicking the ball and running is kind of like a game mechanic. There are ways to enhance the mechanics, such as having the kick have a huge impact when kicked with enough force. That's essentially what it is. And from what I've seen talked about the drone mechanic, people usually like to compare it to the grab pack from Poppy Playtime. I can see why people do. They got the hand sitting there in the hallway trick and slapped some dollar store acrylic paint onto it. But that's not what this reads to me as. Thing is, I come from a modding scene. Typically, the concept process usually goes, what's the idea for the story, how difficult do we want this mod to be? But there are times where I've fallen into the trap of, what mechanic can I do to stand out from the rest? It's not entirely a bad mentality, but it shouldn't be your main mentality. And Garner Ban Ban just proves as to why. For starters, while the idea of having a drone within a horror game is not a concept I've heard before. It's not an interesting enough mechanic to hold a game up. Hell, it's not interesting to hold up three hours of gameplay. Especially with the way that the mechanic is executed, it's really not that interesting. Like, this is just pointing and saying, go over there. But it's a game mechanic. Why? And don't come at me with, well, there is a yellow glass. Are you kidding me? This is just a more convoluted way of telling somebody to go over there. This isn't enhancing a mechanic. This is just lazy level design. The only time the game feels different is with the floor button here, where you have to stand on it and whatnot. But by the time they introduce this new game mechanic, we're already two hours into the game. We're already two thirds into the game and it just now introduces a new mechanic. Are you serious? But doesn't Delta- No. It doesn't introduce a new mechanic, it just gives that mechanic to the rest of your party. These aren't comparable. Again, this mechanic isn't interesting enough to hold an entire game. They could have done several things to make this drone interesting. They could have made the drone go into areas you can't go, it could have spied in areas you don't want to go, it could have carried you and objects around. That's something Bam Bam mentions the drones can do. Just something to make this interesting. But we don't get that. We just get this. What bothers me about this drone isn't it just being a mechanic. It's also the reason why it's here. You know. Mechanics and puzzles don't just affect gameplay. It also affects world building. Let's take this temperature puzzle. It's kind of an interesting puzzle. You have to use this wall decal that shows who performs better to figure out what order to press the buttons on the desk. It actually makes the player think. But while this works as a decent puzzle, it falls apart in terms of world building. Like, why is this a wall decal? Wouldn't it be cheaper to have this as a whiteboard or a corkboard with a bunch of construction paper and paper decorations like they do in main office settings? How often are they replacing this wall decal and changing the password? Because the solution is based off their performance scores. Is it weekly? Monthly? Yearly? Why are the keycards in the closet and not just some desk? In fact, let me point this out for other levels too. Why does this kindergarten have buttons that have to be pressed by drones to open the doors? What if a kid is stuck or there's a fire? In fact, why does this area need drones? This is a kindergarten, not an area normally covered by maintenance workers. Why is there yellow glass? Especially if these buttons have to be used to open certain doors. Isn't this a safety issue? How often are they replacing this glass? Doesn't this eat into the budget? And if you think I'm overthinking this, first of all, you're watching an over-analytical Ban Ban review. I feel like it's a little too late to say that. Secondly, even then, I'm really not. Is that how everyone who works at the Garden of Ban Ban gets into that room? This is just something that other games just think about as they make the mechanics. Tears of the Kingdom does this by giving Link an arm that belonged to a Zonai named Raru. The reason why Link has his arm is because if he didn't, he would have died. I mean, after seeing this, I could see why he could have died. 
but this also affects the gameplay by giving Link special abilities such as Recall, Fuse, Ultra Hand, and Ascend, which is every speedrunner's dream! This ends up making the gameplay interesting because instead of using the almighty Master Sword to smack the ever-loving shit out of a local moblin, you could just use a rock on the stick to do the same job. Or just take revenge on the Koroks. You're going to space. And that's just one way world building affects mechanics. Relating to mascot horror, what about FNAF where you play as a security guard? Or Amanda the Adventurer where you play as a niece watching VHS tapes and doing puzzles in an environment that Amanda controls? Perhaps Bendy and the Ink Machine, where you play as a guy who's stuck in a loop in an inky atmosphere. And these games think about gameplay as well as world building. And this is one of the most simple aspects of game design. So no, I don't think Ban Ban should get a pass on this, cause it's really not that deep, and it shouldn't be. So for this section, it will have to be a little different since these sections aren't really big enough to have their own sections, but I feel like it's still important that I mention these critiques I have. I'll just have to make a lightning round spinning out critiques from here and there just to get my final thoughts. Is that fair? I, I feel like it's fair. No matter what version of the game you play, you are bound to run into some bugs. In Chapter 2, you're supposed to run away from Slow Selene into this room, but there's a chance that she'll just kill the person right through the wall. In Chapter 3, there's an optimization bug where it just loads the area in chunks, and sometimes, it just loads them in the wrong place and your game freezes for a second just trying to fix this. In Chapter 4, there are several bugs. There's one where Batman's head just snaps to the player's direction if the player gets close enough. Another one is where after the explosion in this cutscene, the environment loads in before the black screen does. Here's a big one. The pause menu doesn't pause. The pause menu doesn't pause. That's to not even mention that there are times where Sheriff Toadster just stops running, effectively softlocking the game, and you have to restart it just to end it. I feel like this goes without saying, but to avoid this issue, just get somebody to playtest the game that isn't on the development team. Same goes to the gameplay issue as well. And don't use a dev, cause a dev is gonna know what to do and not be a good stand-in for a player who's first introduced into the game. This is another issue that the game has, because there are times where the instructions are either confusing or straight up non-existent. Like the first chapter. Yeah, it's been a while since I mentioned the first chapter, huh? Where the game straight up abandons you and expects you to figure out how to kill Opila. Or just to even know that you're supposed to kill her. Or this vent area. The fact that the instructions are written on the wall like this is not really helpful. What also doesn't help is that the bird only chirps in a very specific spot. Again, this isn't very helpful to the player whatsoever. A way to make this area better is to indirectly tell the player how to get past this section. Here's a way that I would approach this area. What you could do is that you can have Nab Nab make noise as he's going through the vents above the player. As he does this, the bird chirps aggressively. Sheriff Toaster's like, hold on, something's here. Then, you hear some slight banging in some vents, FNAF 4 style. And when you walk up to a vent, the bird's chirping will get louder. Just throwing an idea out there. There's another instance where the instructions are weird. Like, in the second chapter, the instructions say that the glass breaks if you hit it indirectly. Except, no, it's not indirectly. It's directly with extra steps. When you are indirectly hitting something, you are hitting something else to break the glass. You are still hitting the glass, but now you're doing it with extra steps. Even though with this one, you can break this glass by just putting the drone on top of the door and then aim the drone to the bottom of the glass and it breaks. You can solve the puzzle without doing the puzzle. Ugh. A masterpiece, everyone. This is the game we're calling a masterpiece. In terms of writing, I would say it has its moments where the writing is actually kind of decent. Like this joke here about how a person's co-workers are getting mad at them because rather than helping, they're leaving fucking lore papers. It's a decent joke. Or this little speech that Singer Flynn has about sorrow and life. <laughs> Man, life has been hitting this guy hard recently. But it also has its moments, albeit very small, where the writing can be kind of inconsistent. Like Bam Bam's belief on who he is. So, it's been established that he thinks he's Uthman, his genome donor. 
and when he reintroduces himself, he doesn't introduce himself as Ban Ban, but as Uthman. That's consistent! What isn't consistent is when he's in this elevator behind the glass, he says, and I quote, but if you had seen, seen me, you wouldn't, wouldn't have trusted me, me. I'd I know, know it. it. And if you say that they fixed this issue in the fourth chapter, then what I have to say is, no, they didn't. Because in that chapter, about 10 minutes later, he says he wants to get rid of an imposter. That being Mr. Kebab Man. And who does Mr. Kebab Man resemble? Bam Bam. I say that because of the party hats that the guy wears and because no human looks like this. But then you guys might have another counterclaim being, ah, but what if he thinks he's Uthman, but physically he knows he's Ban Ban. And yeah, I would agree with you and say it's a pretty good save. Except it's not, because in the case update report that came before the one I showed previously, it says that mirrors don't work on the guy because he thinks he's physically Uthman. Luckily, there aren't too many inconsistencies, and in fact, I would even go so far as to say that this might be the biggest one. But I would still say that you have to try to keep things consistent within the logic that the world runs in. Just write a little set of notes on what works and doesn't within the logic of the world and all that. It doesn't have to be big or grandiose, just so long as you and the other developers can understand it. You would think as an artist and a super mediocre animator, I would have a lot to say on the animation. But in all honesty, I really don't. I mean, by just looking at it, I think you could see what the problem is. I don't think it takes me to tell you what's wrong. So, this section will be brief. Rarely, if ever, there's a moment where the animation looks decent. From a character getting smacked from the almighty god that is Jumbo Josh, to a... Uh, what, what the fuck? No animation, I say, can be saved. And if anything, there seems to be less of it in the more recent chapters. Cause while Bam Bam gets that subtle body language as he talks to you about three birds, one stone, Peter Giggle just stands there with the stare of a toddler about to tell their mom that they flew up. Yes, I'm still mad about that. And I'll be fair to the game since I do want to genuinely critique the game and not just shit on it for an hour and a half, but the music of the game is actually pretty decent. I would say the worst ones would be these two, but besides that, the OST is actually pretty decent. I prefer their more ambient tracks like Pancreas and Kingdom Doomed, but that's just more of a preference if anything. That and Rivals, which is really funny because it was made by Rocket Music, the same people that made a song that I bought back in school, I think. Just thought the coincidence was funny. But yeah, no problems with the music except for the naming scheme. Because there are certain songs that aren't named within the context for the scene, like Kingdom Doomed Slow, which is a main hub music for Chapter 4. Like, they could have done what Toby Fox did with Spamton in Deal Gone Wrong, where Deal Gone Wrong is just Spamton but extremely slowed down. They could have named the song Mushroom Courtyard or Royal Meaning, especially since it's supposed to play from a different context from the original. And there are other songs that have this problem. Family Feud plays not when Jumbo Josh, Bam Bam, and Singer Flynn are fighting like the thumbnail would make you believe, but when Bam Bam is chasing you on the tag version of Bird Racing. Coaster Crow plays when Bam Bam is chasing Nab Nab because he stole Mr. Kebab Man, despite Sheriff Toadster never being present while the song is in use. A Mother's Wrath is used as general chase music but was first used for Opila's chase sequence. But Jurassic Meow is used as chase music for Bitter Giggle, then as boss music, but is named after the second character that uses it and not the first? Like seriously, I had to pull up a playthrough of the game just to figure out when these songs were actually played within the game. Here's when they're actually played versus the way they're named. Half of them are named correctly based off of context. So I feel like this issue would be fixed if you simply kept track of where the song is used and how that affects the name of the song. Because if anything, this issue seems to be caused not by laziness but out of general game development. It seems like they just thought of where the song should be used, made it, and then thought where else it should be used and used it without thinking how that affects the name. So just think of the name of the song as well as the context and for love of god, please have more tracks within the game. Because the majority of the game really is just dead air, so I feel like adding more ambient tracks will help the gameplay not feel like a drag. So, after all this, what else do I have to say about this game? Well, honestly, I, I don't think it's worth your money. 
because there are other games that are so much better than Garden that cost less than this game does. And I'm serious. I'm Scared is worth less than any chapter of Garden and is just as long as chapter 4 is. You have to pay $20 to play the entirety of Garden in its current state, so it makes me extra mad knowing that there's games like Amori where it takes 7 to 15 hours to play and it costs just as much as Garden does. Worst of all, it takes about 3 hours to fucking finish Garden. You can't seriously complain about people refunding your game for a shitpost when you're charging $20 to play this game and the quality looks like this. Are you kidding me? So I don't recommend you buy, let alone download this game. It's not worth your time, it's not worth your PC, and it's certainly not worth your money. Because at the end of the day, this game is a shit show. It doesn't care about how fun it is, it doesn't care about your time, it only cares about what's in your wallet, and it happens to be green. Hey, so thank you so much for watching. I know this video took like forever, and trust me, I wanted this video to be done with a long time ago, but I mean, here we are. So um, I'm gonna address like a few things uh, towards the end of this video, but first of all, all the footage that, or the majority of the footage that is within the video isn't really mine. Shout out to like Babyzone who allowed me to use it, um, as well as like Bandon and several other people. I'll go ahead and leave the credit in the description, but for next time, for like next videos that I'm gonna be making in the future, I'm gonna reduce that to the point where I record my own footage exclusively for the majority of it. Um, the only reason why it didn't happen this time was because not only did I- I don't have, like, a lot of money to spend for, like, for garden, but on top of that, my computer's not really the best. It, it's a- it's a laptop. Can handle four games that have so many polygons and then a bunch of other programs on it, so playing it safe um i just didn't get garden but for next time or future videos that i want to make i want to reduce the amount of borrowed footage so look forward to that in the future um another thing i'm also opening up memberships now yay you, you guys seriously really made the the subscriber account go from like a thousand to like 1,820? And that- that was just unexpected. Like, you guys, I seriously work quick. I didn't even post anything within the recent video and this current one, and you just- just did it. <laughs> so, thank you so much, and because of that, now we have memberships! Yay! For the first- for the first, like, membership, it's just gonna be something simple, just emotes and a uh, member badge but with the second one it's gonna be that plus behind the scenes stuff as well as like art and a uh, discount on the commission i'm not going to do anything too crazy with the membership perks for now but um this is just a start if you want to support me there's that along with that due to my prolonged absence on youtube i now came up with four different videos yay <laughs> so look forward to that as well thank you again so much for watching feel free to subscribe feel free to follow me on instagram twitter tumblr tiktok and just anywhere anywhere is fine uh thank you again seriously thank you so much and don't forget to stay hydrated drink water have a good one